Hello and welcome to The King's Keys. My name is Danny Womack and I'm very excited to be with you today. Today we're going to be looking at um, how the Lord orchestrated the conversion of Saul. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. We're going to start right off in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager, eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So if you know the story of Saul, this is um, a guy that was just an absolute enemy to Christians. He sought to, um, to persecute them. He sought to arrest them and to bring them back. Anybody that would proclaim the name of Jesus. And he had a reputation such that Christians of the day knew that um, this was Saul and this was his plan and this was what he had wanted to do. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So here's Saul, he's on his way, he's got this letter, he's on his way to Damascus. And all of a sudden, that's the moment in time God decided to have an encounter with Saul. And I want you to think about the people that you know that are in your life, that you maybe would think are enemies of Christ. People who you could never see them coming in and having a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's because they're angry. Maybe it's because they are hurt. Whatever it is. And to recognize that for this gentleman, this is the extreme that Jesus went to to make sure that he had an opportunity to have an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So there's Saul just walking on his way and all of a sudden there's this bright light that shines and he hears his voice. He, he, he hears a voice. So Paul, Saul falls to the ground and he hears, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Which brings a good point as well, that there's times when people are doing things against us and, and we think we're being persecuted. And here Jesus made it very clear that Saul was persecuting him, that we are the body of Christ. And when we're persecuted, they are really persecuting Jesus. And so Jesus was, was asking, why, why are you persecuting me? But Saul, who had done this his entire life, Saul knew the voice. Saul immediately said, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So he identifies, Jesus identifies himself as Jesus and identifies that he is the one all this time that Saul has actually been persecuting. And he tells Saul, get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Here's one of the parts that I love. The men with Saul, with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. So this is the audible voice of God speaking. So not just Saul, but those around him hear this voice. And Saul does exactly what he was instructed. And even that part's quite remarkable. Here's somebody who has just come to recognize Jesus, just heard his voice, and immediately he chooses to obey. He does exactly what the voice tells him to do. He, uh, verse eight, it says, Saul picked himself up off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Okay, so put yourself in his position. He has this incredible encounter. This amazing thing happens. Even the people around him hear the voice, and he gets up immediately to obey what the voice told him to do. He is now a follower of Jesus. He is going to do what Jesus told him to do, and he gets up to go into the city. But there's a hiccup, there's a challenge, there's an obstacle that has come in the way. He's blind, he can't see anything. 
And I think sometimes for some of us, that would be a reason to quit. My heart was right, I was willing to obey, I was willing to go, but this thing happened. This thing came up, or this thing made it harder. Or, 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 where we don't follow. We don't, we allow some hiccup to stop us from what God has told us to do. But this brand new Christian didn't let that happen. See, as devoted as Paul or Saul was to his former lifestyle and the persecution of Christians, that personality trait that made him so driven and so focused and so determined, that trait God was going to use for his kingdom. He was going to use that same personality trait that maybe got him in trouble before, that maybe caused him to be so far in one direction before. God was going to use that for the kingdom. He was going to redeem everything about Saul and how he went forward. So even this hiccup of blindness didn't cause Saul to re-pray to see if he, God still wanted him to do this. It didn't cause him to say, well, well, as soon as I get my vision back, I'll go do what you asked me to do. No, he knew what he was instructed and nothing was going to stop him from that. So he began to go. And so it says, so his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. There he remained blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So everything, now if you can picture, he's obeyed, he's in Damascus. Everything that was familiar and known and, and the way of life for him before, it was all going to change. He didn't know in this moment if he was going to get his, his sight back or not. He didn't know. We don't know when the vision came to him. Verse 10, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. So we have something similar. We have this gentleman, Ananias, who has been a believer in Jesus. And he is, um, he is seeing a vision. And the Lord spokes to him and says his name. And he replies, yes, Lord. And he's waiting for the instructions to be given. Verse 11, the Lord says, go over to Straight Street from the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. And I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. So as the Lord speaking to Ananias over here, he is speaking to Saul and telling, giving Saul a vision of what's going to happen. When Saul was blinded on the road, when everything about life was about to change, God already had a plan. In our transition seasons and in our times of, 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 of change, of our hard times, of our times of challenges, God already has the solution. God already has the plan working. God's already prepared somebody to come and to assist in the process. He does not leave us in a situation where he doesn't have a way for the transformation to come from that. Ananias was the key. It was absolutely wonderful that Saul had this conversion moment. And for Saul, that was the highlight. That was God's plan for, for him to become a Christian. But for the fullness of what his destiny was going to be, he needed somebody else. He needed someone to come and to guide him and to show him and to lead him. Even though he was the one chosen, he wasn't chosen in isolation. So God says to Ananias, go. Go be the solution. Go help this man reach his destiny. But Ananias too had a little bit of a hiccup. While, while Saul, when he arose and in his attempt to be obedient, his efforts to be obedient, he was blind. Ananias, in his attempt to be obedient, he was a little bit scared and concerned. But Lord exclaimed Ananias, 
I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Honestly, all Ananias is doing is telling Jesus things he already knows. He had no new information to bring to the table. Everything that he said, Jesus already knew. But there was already steps in place to prepare the way for Ananias too. What Ananias didn't know is God had already spoken to Saul. There had already been a moment while Ananias' job was to come and help transition Saul from his situation to his transformation to his destiny, the way had already been made. As Ananias was the solution for Saul, so Saul was the solution for Ananias. And so the Lord begins to tell Ananias to not be concerned. He says, but the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he will suffer for my name's sake. So the Lord says, listen to Ananias, I know. And I know even more than you know. I know not just what this man has done in his past, but I know what his destiny is. And you are a key to get him to that place of his destiny. So go. But notice what wasn't said. It wasn't said. The Lord didn't tell Ananias, don't worry about it. You won't be arrested. The Lord didn't tell Ananias, don't worry about it. Saul's now a Christian. And so you don't have to worry about your safety or, or who will take care of, of anything else if you get arrested. God didn't give those types of confirmations to Ananias. What he did say was, go, I've got this. I've already appointed him for a certain thing. You haven't told me anything I don't know. I've got this. I'm making a way for you. I've already done a work you just haven't seen yet. You just don't know. This for Ananias was all about trusting Jesus. It was all about trusting Jesus with what he knew and it was all about trusting Jesus with what he didn't yet know. What is God already doing for you that you just don't know about? How is he already making a way you just don't know? And if you don't obey, if you don't go like Ananias went, you'll never know that it was already provided. It was already taken over. The work was already done. He's already advocating on your behalf. He said to go, and he said he is authorized, or he says, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. So when he goes and he sees him, all he knows is what the Lord had told him. He knows that the man had seen a vision that Saul had seen a vision of Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he could see. He knew that God had spoke to Ananias about what Saul's future was going to be. This is all he knows. He doesn't know the, the rest of the details, but he goes and when he sees Saul, when he sees the gentleman that had been his enemy, that had been the one persecuting those that believed like Ananias did, it says, he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. Now, I don't know if at that point Saul knew or, or Ananias knew and could tell of the conversion that had taken place inside of Saul or not. But he knew the destiny that God had spoken. He knew that God had said, I have appointed him. He knew that. So he goes in with love. He goes in with unity. He goes in with a, with a hand of fellowship. Brother Saul, 
He didn't go in with an attitude because of the things that Saul had done in, a pa in the past. He went in with an eye and a perspective to the future, to Saul's future, because that's what God had spoken. Literally in this moment, I believe that Ananias is seeing Saul through the eyes of heaven, seeing the potential, seeing the anointing, seeing the appointing. That's the way we're supposed to see people. We're supposed to see people through the eyes of heaven that isn't nearly as concerned about their past as we are committed to helping them walk into their future and what they've been anointed and appointed to do. Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. I believe this moment was pivotal. This moment was pivotal in both of these men having a confirmation that their trust in Jesus was well placed. For Saul, he not only had to trust Jesus, he had to trust the believers, the very people that he had persecuted before, that there was this man that was going to come and find him in a vulnerable state of blindness and not hold his reputation and his past against him, but be willing to meet him in that moment. It's a moment of vulnerability. And Ananias met Saul there, didn't hold his past against him, but prayed and saw the scales fall from his eyes and saw um, him regain his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. What an amazing moment for Ananias and for Saul, one that if either one of these men had let a hiccup or a difficulty or a challenge prevent them from fully obeying what God told them to do, it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. They both had to trust God. They both had to make that decision. And honestly, they both had to trust that God was going to keep them safe, that he was going to uh, fulfill what he said that he was going to fulfill. There's more trusting that needed to happen in the story. Verse 19, Saul, Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? See, there was no delay. Paul or Saul had this amazing encounter with God and immediately changed his way and began preaching. He stayed with the disciples and if you can or with the believers and if you can imagine the trust that that took. It took trust in that regard too. But immediately he began walking in his calling. Immediately he began teaching and preaching in the synagogues that that Jesus was indeed the son of God. Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Saul held this place where he was going to be able to convince and to, to be listened to by people that maybe the other believers weren't going to be able to. And all of that could have been prevented. It wouldn't have, have gone down the way it did if Ananias hadn't been obedient to, to buy into a destiny versus a, a past. And as Saul began to preach, he grew and grew in the power and the, the anointing, and people could not deny that he was the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. 
They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. But Saul was told about the plot. Now Saul's got the disciples and the believers. They've got his back. And they're listening. And as word comes that there's this plot against his life, while he was the one that was seeking their life previously, now as there's this, this, um, this plot against his life, the body of Christ rallies behind him. And during the night, they lowered him in a large basket through the opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers. He tried, just like he was in Damascus, he went back to Jerusalem and, and he tried to meet with the believers. But those believers, they were afraid. They were focused on what his reputation was and what they knew about him. The situation, they didn't recognize yet that there had been a transformation in this man. And they were afraid. But Barnabas, Barnabas went to him and Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to, the, to Damascus. So Barnabas is telling the story. He's making sure they understand he is the bridge between Saul with, with the reputation that scared people and the believers who weren't yet convinced of the transformation. Again, one man who is helping to be this bridge to launch Saul into the destiny that God had, to what God had appointed for him to do. Do we see that if any point that there was um, either Ananias or Barnabas who would, would have been too scared to go and, and to encounter Saul, to take the risk, that maybe they hadn't fully got what they were supposed to get. They hadn't been willing to take the risk. What would have happened? But because they were, Saul's life was spared in Damascus. And now as he's back in Jerusalem, he has the, the hope of fellowship with the believers. Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. That's all it took. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some of the Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. Again, they spared his life so that he could continue in what was before him because the way had been made for him. While it wasn't an easy road, why it wasn't without obstacles and challenges. And that same determination that Saul had when he was an enemy of Christ, when he was an enemy of, of the body, it was that same determination that helped him overcome obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, death threat after death threat, all the persecution that he endured. He was uniquely wired for this job. And if people hadn't been willing to trust the Lord's work inside of him, it wouldn't have been the same journey that it was, even with his reputation. How many people do we need to begin to trust the journey that's inside of them? It doesn't mean that they're perfect. It doesn't mean that they won't make mistakes. But there is a journey and a destiny inside of them that if we don't come along and support and trust, what are we hindering from happening? What appointment and anointing are we hindering? Because we're not trusting the work of God within somebody's life. So they got him to Tarsus, his hometown. Verse 31, the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it grew in numbers. What a remarkable thing for them to see. 
that through this journey with this gentleman that had been such a persecutor, that now as, as they uh, as they supported him and as they, they uh, protected him and as I'm sure they taught him things and, and saw him grow and helped him grow, kept him safe, sent him on his way on his journey. Now in these areas, there was peace and with that became stronger. How did it become stronger? The believers lived in the fear of the Lord. They weren't living in fear of other things. They were living in the fear of the Lord willing and, and ready to be obedient to the things that the, that the Lord said to him, to them. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. What a perfect picture of what we would want for the, the body of Christ today, to believe in each other, to believe in God's mighty work um, happening and stirring within each person. To support, they weren't um, to, to to protect, to not be to not be concerned about if they take away anything from anybody else's role, but recognizing that each person has a destiny, and the whole kingdom of God is benefited when each believer overcomes a challenge or a hiccup to obedience and trusts the Lord, trust what the Lord is saying, trust that the Lord is already working out that situation. Let's take a moment and pray. So Father, I feel like there's a few things in here that we need to uh, take note of. God, I pray for each one with a past that has rendered them um, supposedly untrustworthy to others. God, would the, the true work that you've done in their hearts be revealed to the people around them. May they be able to be trusted as you are working in their hearts and in their lives. May they find community and may they find a a tribe to, to teach and to minister with. God, I pray that you would allow people to truly see each other through the eyes of heaven. With, with destiny in mind versus the things that had happened in the past. God, may we not let obstacles like fear or blindness, whether spiritual blindness or, or physical difficulties, may we let nothing stand in our way of obeying you. And when you tell us that you're at work within somebody's life, may we see it. May we see through heaven's eyes to see you at work in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.